Um, in Matthew 20, sorry, Matthew 6, verse 25, um, he starts the section on anxiety or worry and fear. Um, but right before that, he's talking about treasures. Um, in heaven, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And then he goes into verse 25. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much? Or are you not worth much more than they? Verse twenty-six or verse twenty-seven is a very helpful verse as well. And who of you, by being worried, could add a single cubit to his life, or add like an hour to his lifespan? Worrying isn't going to make things last longer, it's not going to make the day last longer to accomplish more of your tasks. Verse 28, talk about clothing. Uh, don't worry about those things. Verse 30, God clothes the grass. He will clothe you. Verse 31, do not worry, saying then what we eat, what we drink, or what we wear for clothing. For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Then the key here, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so you see in verse 24, talk about not serving both God and money, God and mammon. You can't have two masters. Verse 30, then you're seeking his kingdom and not yours. The whole kind of idea of, of worry is sort of couched between those ideas um, that we are not to serve money as our God, but to serve God and seek first his kingdom and trust for his provision. Now, obviously, we don't want to say, I can trust God to provide for me and not work hard. That's not what he's saying. We know that all throughout scripture. God never says, be lazy. <clears throat> um, in fact, in First Timothy 5, Paul says, if you don't provide for your family, like that's bad. That you, sh you are not doing your job. Um, so what he's saying here, don't worry about these things. He's not saying don't work hard for these things, don't pursue these things, but don't worry about it because you're not serving money, you're not worshiping money and wealth and prestige and these sort of things so that all we do is worry about and think about and are gripped by fear based off of our possessions and these sort of things. So it's just a, a fascinating text, a fascinating passage, especially Jesus giving this to a uh, of a more agricultural society where they were working day to day in the fields and these sort of things that uh, we don't have a lot of modern conveniences as we do now. So again, just a very kind of fascinating text that we'll get into a little more in more detail here uh, with fear uh, and, and anxiety. All right, um, but before we get into maybe more, um, more of the text itself, <clears throat> just a few definitions excuse me, of what uh, anxiety or what fear is. Um, you could sort of look at anxiety and kind of define it this way. Um, I have that in your notes there. Again, anxiety is a, a feeling of agitation or unease or concern about an imminent event with an uncertain outcome. Uh, and often, often associated with fear of the future, like verse 25 here. What will I eat? What will I drink? What will I where um, the word there for worry in Matthew 25, it means to like divide or to rip apart, um, or it has the idea of to distract. So distracting your attention or to divide the mind is the idea. When we are anxious, um, we are distracted in our mind uh, by some undue kind of unnecessary concern, if you will, or our mind is divided or parted when we should be thinking about, say, God and worshiping God and hearing him, our minds are then divided into thinking about and worrying about and being concerned about the thing that we are anxious about, the, the circumstance or the thing or whatever it may be, the thing where maybe we're unable 
to control. Again, this is not talking about you don't plan, you don't make, um, again, you don't plan for the future, you don't work hard, you don't seek to do, um, you know, let's seek a job and, and a paycheck and these sort of things, but it's anxiety is sort of that unnecessary kind of concern of maybe trying to control a situation or control a certain outcome. And we know that we can't. And so we are just anxiously trying to make sure that it does go about our way as much as we can. Um, I think this quote's from MacArthur. Yeah. Um, he says, anxiety is at its core an inappropriate response in light of circumstances. It's very different from the cares and concerns of, in life that cause people to attend to business in a responsible way. Right. You know, anxiety then rips sort of rips into our heart, if you will, and our minds and, and you know, it distracts or tears our attention from thinking about maybe trying to find solutions um, um, to things or trying to seek out the Lord. Um, <clears throat> it's ripping into those things and it is, it is dividing our attention from, you know, from the Lord to maybe our control of certain things, right? Um, Fear, similarly, um, can be described as an unpleasant emotion caused by a belief that someone or something is dangerous, which again is fine, likely to cause pain or a threat, and that's not necessarily wrong, right, in and of itself, um, but it can be to such the extreme that we're gripped by it or we don't make, um, maybe we don't make decisions in faith um, to do something. We make decisions based off of a fear of an, an uncertainty, a fear of an unknown outcome. Or um, uh, you know, or fearing people's thoughts or people's approval or people's opinions and these sort of things, right? Or because of the fear of the unknown of what may happen, uh, we don't move forward in faith or we don't do some things that we maybe should be doing or not obeying God in a certain area. Say, for example, even just sharing the gospel, we can fear maybe somebody's response. And so we don't maybe show the gospel or not as faithful as we should, or we're fearful of how someone will respond to confronting them. And so we don't do that um, or, you know, so on those, those sort of things. Um, and we can't really separate fear and anxiety necessarily either. Cause they, they're pretty, they're pretty similar um, sort of emotional responses. They're pretty similar in our thinking that we see in scripture. Um, in you know multiple different place, places in the Psalms and the Old Testament narratives and New Testament with Christ and with Paul, again the fear and anxiety are very very similar in that respect. Um, again, many people classify their fear again as a feeling of agitation or anxiety because of the danger of some unknown thing. Um, people who are typically fearful or typically very anxious people. Um, and fear, again, like anxiety, is not um, a thing in and of itself. Anxiety isn't like the root problem. Fear isn't necessarily the, the main problem. Um, it's not a thing. It's a response, right? Fear and anxiety are emotional responses. Like anger is not a thing that I can kind of hold on to. Um, uh, fear is, uh, or anger is uh, an emotional response. It can be good sometimes or it can be bad. Fear and anxiety can be very similar. They can be very strong emotions. Um, sometimes the fear that we have, uh, uh, fear of some unknown or fear of some danger is not based off of any real danger. It's based off of an unforeseen or a, a maybe a make-believe danger in, in our minds, things that we think are real but maybe aren't necessarily um and i'm talking about like you're seeing things in your mind or you're you know you have a little you know imaginary friend not like that but the sense of um you know, we can we can elevate certain circumstances or situations so high in our mind that we're afraid of something that's not really like grounded in reality it's not really those things aren't really maybe as bad um as we uh, are making them out to be right um <clears throat> so we just got to be mindful of that as well um <clears throat> especially even with our kids i mean at times one of our daughters uh when she was younger i was just really fearful of um when she would be laid down on the floor or really anywhere she would be laid down on her back she'd be afraid that she would fall 
but when we lay her down like on the floor, she'd have, she'd like grab the floor. Like I'm going to fall. Like you're on the ground. You're not going to fall off the ground onto the ground. <clears throat> so it was just a, an imaginary fear about something. And <clears throat> obviously that's a toddler who's doing something like that. <clears throat> uh, but uh, as we get older, those fears, those mindsets can still grow and into a uh, deeper understanding or deeper way. Um, <clears throat> also, I, uh, I this helpful quote from MacArthur in his book, um, talking about kind of God's peace, freedom from fear, or freedom from anxiety. He says this, that, <clears throat> um, you know, fear is like a slave master. He says, extreme displays of anxiety are often related to an unfounded fear, so overwhelming and so overpowering that it clutches a person's heart. It forces the heart to beat faster, get physically, gets chills, perspiration, makes a person feel completely unable to cope with the moment. It's, it's controlling our, our life. Right? These fears and anxieties can be controlling <clears throat> our lives in these ways, both physically and emotionally. Again, however, there's a fear is not again, necessarily in and of itself bad. Um, there can be helpful things to fear, wise things to be afraid of, wise things to, to see as danger. <clears throat> Obviously, we, um, we want to have a fear of God, but I guess, well, before that, a reasonable fear of danger or difficulty, right? You don't jump out of an airplane without a parachute, or you don't do that anyways because it's dumb. Um, <clears throat> But you don't jump out of you know an airplane without a parachute, think, saying God will protect me. That's not that's there's a healthy fear of danger there, right? <clears throat> you don't go swimming and pull great white sharks. You don't, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you you do certain things. Again, I, I put in here this is during COVID. You need to wash your hands to prevent sickness. Which you wash your hands, right? You go to the bathroom, wash your hands. It's, there's wisdom there, um, <clears throat> right? You um, you know, th there's going to be reasonable fears of of certain things that, that that are that are realities that we want to be make be wise about and not put ourselves in unnecessarily foolish danger. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we also want to have a fear of God, right? We want to have a fear of the Lord that because of who he is, <clears throat> we we fear him. We fear his we fear his wrath to some degree, knowing I'm not going to face it, but we understand what God's wrath means because as that wrath is placed upon Christ. We want to fear God in a sense of honor and respect and, and worship and love um, <clears throat> and a sense of reverence, right? A reverence that I don't want to displease God. Um, like our kids should have a healthy fear of mom and dad. If I disobey, there's discipline, right? So that's sort of that idea with the Lord as well. Um, <clears throat> okay. Does it make sense? All right. <clears throat> now, again, what does the Bible say about Anxiety and fear, then we got those kind of definitions down. Well, again, Matthew 6, we already um, read that. Um, um, we have that passage. Then we have Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 4 through 9. Let me, let me just read this again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice, let your gentle spirit be known to all men, or let your considerableness or considerable spirit may be known to all men. For the Lord is near, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things and the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Um, those two verses, or those two sections of verses, uh, can be very helpful um, when shepherding somebody who's struggling with with anxiety or fear um these aren't the only two but i think these are two that are just very helpful that kind of often help us to get to the point and get to the root issues get to the heart and so i've made some notes here kind of based off of these two verses Again, it's not like a sermon but there's just some observations about <clears throat> these verses that are helpful uh, again these are things you can even take to somebody and sit down with somebody um 
and uh, who you know is struggling or yourself is struggling with anxiety or fear and help them kind of work through that even with this simple outline. Nothing profound here, but um, just some helpful things. You know, the first thing with both Matthew 6 and Philippians 4, we need to see that anxiety and fear and those spots, ang anxious and fearful thoughts are directly related to our thinking. They're directly related to our thought process, especially in, in Philippians 4. Um, uh, verse 8 um, talks about, again, whatever is true, honorable, lovely, those sort of things, or to dwell on those things or to think on those things, to meditate upon those things in our mind. Well, when we're not doing that, <clears throat> our hearts can become more anxious and more fearful and more overwhelmed and maybe with, with the circumstances of life, right? We're not taking those thoughts captive, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3. Um, <clears throat> and that's going to be pretty important. You know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Ephesians uh, 4, 23 are also talk about how our, our minds need to be renewed with things that are true, um, being renewed with the with with the word of God. Um, so uh, anxiety and fear are direct are, are related to our our thinking, maybe misinformed thoughts, wrong thoughts, sinful thoughts. Um, we maybe lack certain information and certain things. And so we're just not thinking clearly or not thinking rightly um, about whatever the situation may be, whether it be a fear of man, um, whether it be um, just anxious over a, a certain circumstance or situation. Uh, we're not thinking clearly either about God or about the situation. Um, many people think that anxiety comes because they are thinking too much and they should just stop thinking. So what do they do? They maybe try to veg out. They try to get their mind distracted from things. Problem is not that they're thinking too much, but they're not thinking enough, really. They're not thinking correctly. They're not thinking on the goodness and faithfulness of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones commented on that and said in his book, Spiritual Depression, he said, um, which I think that's his book, uh, yeah, it comes from spiritual depression. He says, faith, according to our Lord's teaching, is primarily thinking. We must spend more time in study, uh, in studying, excuse me, our Lord's lessons and observation and deduction. The Bible is full of logic, and we must never think of faith as something purely mystical. We do not just sit down in an armchair and expect marvelous things to happen to us. Right? This is not Christian faith. Christian faith is Faith is essentially thinking. You can look at the birds, think about them, draw your deductions. Look at the grass, again, consider them. Faith, if you like, can be defined like this. It is a man insisting upon thinking when everything seems determined to bludgeon and knock him down. The trouble with the persons of little faith is that instead of controlling his own thought, his thought is being controlled by something else. And as we put it, he goes round and round in circles. That is the essence of worry, he says. That is, not, that is not thought. That is the absence of thought or a failure to think. And I think that's just a, that's a very clear way I think, to think about it and to understand it. Um, that when we're anxious and fearful, it's not worth thinking, not, not thinking enough. We're, it's, uh, or if we're thinking too much, rather, it's that we're not thinking enough. Uh, we're not thinking clearly and biblically. Right? So directly related to our thinking. Well, secondly, then, we'll let her be there. Again, anxiety then, and fear are often focused on the on circumstances. Then, why is that? Why we're we not thinking clearly? Because we're focused on the circumstances rather than on God. Again, Matthew six, we're focused on um, food, covering these sort of things. Philippians four, we're you know we're not sure what exactly is going on there, but they're focused on circumstances. They're focused on the situations. Um, and we need to be focused rather than on those situations, but on God, knowing he's in complete control of all the situations, all the circumstances for me and for everyone else. God is not surprised by things. He's not caught by surprise. Um, he is not unaware. He is fully aware of those situations. Again, in Psalm 46, 1 and 2, God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. 
you know, the imagery there is pretty powerful. The earth shakes, it quakes, and the mountains fall down and go into the ocean. He says that we won't fear, even though those, those sort of things will happen. Why? Because he says God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And I mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again that that phrase, a very present help, it literally can be translated that God is more present to you than your trouble. God is more present or God is more near than the trouble is near. That's, that's what that is saying. I think that's helpful for us to remind our own minds and to remind others that, yes, situations are hard. Yes, things are difficult. Yes, crises are hard. That's why they're called crisis situations. But that doesn't mean that God is any less near or that God is any less a refuge for you. And he, in, in crisis situations, he, he is probably more so refuge and the strength for you, the shelter for you in those moments. Because in times of crisis, that's when you need refuges and strength more. That's when you're in trouble, and that's when you need and and, and um, need to be reminded of the help of the Lord. Right? Um, then we can't control our future. We can't control situations. We have to trust in the Lord. Um, also, trust in the Lord does not mean that your circumstances will be changed, however. Trusting in God in the midst of a time of fear and anxiety or unknown um, situations doesn't mean that God will change the circumstance. But it, what we need to do is trust in God and cling to God and go to God regardless of our circumstance um, and respond to him rightly so in spite of maybe how difficult our circumstances are. Uh, let her, let her see. You know, when we're anxious and fearful, we're going to focus on self. Not only are we not focusing on God, then the opposite is true. We're focusing on our selves. Um, again, with our, with our world in which we live, it's so easy to just be thinking about all like every day. There's like a new crisis. There's a new situation. There's a new stupid thing going on in the world. That it's it, it's it's easy to be distracted. It's easy to be caught up in these situations or in our own situations um, <clears throat> and not go to the Lord or not see his faithfulness in the midst of other, maybe other people. Um, maybe we can be gripped in our life by in those fears, by those trials. Um, <clears throat> but if we're not looking to the Lord, we're, we're looking to ourselves as a solution, looking to my way as a, as a solution or my... <clears throat> my desires or my uh, ideas as a solution rather than have I gone to the Lord and asked for wisdom? Have I asked him for help? Have I asked him for strength? Have I asked him for joy and peace in the midst of this? Not just trying to get out of a situation, but how, what can I learn in the midst of the situation? Um, the, the idea for many is that pain or discomfort need to be avoided. And so, those situations come up, painful situations, uncomfortable situations come up. I need to flee those. I need to get rid of those because those are bad. <clears throat> um, rather than looking at, say, places like James 1, that we are to consider it all joy, my brothers, when we encounter various trials. Why should we be joyful? Because we know what those trials produce. They produce endurance. They produce sanctification. Romans 5, very similar. We exalt in our tribulations. We, we exalt knowing that those tribulations bring about our perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character produces hope. <clears throat> right? In times of anxiety and stuff, and, and trial and, and, and fear, we can be caught, caught up in just ourselves and our own ideas on desires and on circumstances rather than, again, focusing on the Lord. What is he doing in and through this trial? What is he doing to mature me? What is he doing to root out sin? What is he doing to mature me in his ways? 
<clears throat> or even thinking about one day I'm going to die. And maybe this trial is what the Lord uses to bring me home. Whatever that trial may be, like a, uh, an illness or a cancer or something like that. Right. Again, we be careful of always seeking to get out of a trial so we're not anxious in the midst of it, but seeing what can God teach me in this. And maybe sometimes, at least this is what I found with, with, uh, with my life, is that sometimes situations come up or trials happen where I find myself becoming anxious again and fearful of something. And it's helpful for me to have those experiences, to have those moments, because I, I, I realize God's not done with me yet. <laughs> I still have room to grow. God still puts me in situations where I'm tempted to be anxious and I do respond in anxiety at times. And so then I'm reminded I, I need to have a greater trust in God in those moments rather than to trust in myself. Maybe for a moment I can be feel like I'm doing okay. I can be feel like I'm doing all right. But then something happens and I'm reminded of, oh, I'm not because I'm anxious right now. I'm not trusting in God as much as maybe I thought that I was. I'm not having as much faith in the Lord as, as I thought I was. So even just thinking that way, that God maybe has me in a, in a situation that is going to tempt me to anxiety and fear for me to realize that I'm not as far along as I need to, as I ought to be, but that I need to trust in him more than I am. Right. Also, being anxious and fearful can, can motivate us to commit other sins. Um, they can, that can motivate us to, or, or tempt us rather, to sin in other ways. Um, and maybe um, when we're anxious and fearful, oftentimes people will respond in anger because they're not getting their way. They'll respond in anger because of uh, circumstances. They'll respond by maybe running to things for comfort and pleasure and relief that are just in of themselves sinful, like sexual lust or um, you know, substances that are uh, either legal or illegal, but they run to those things for, um, for their relief and for their comfort and therefore are now gripped and enslaved by those substances. Again, not everyone does it, obviously, but that's just an example. Um, also, anxiety can be, can be brought on by not being right with, right with God. Um, why, why do you think that might be the case? Why, why do you think that maybe not being right with the Lord and kind of realizing that um, can cause maybe some people to be, to be anxious? What do you think? Well, if you don't have faith in Christ, there's when when trials come, uh, what what do you what do you place your faith in? <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, there's some people that go through trials and they're not believers, and I'm like, how do you deal with that? <laughs> like, where, yeah. where's your comfort to get through things um, to to push through? Um, that's the first thing I thought of. Yeah, no, that's great. I think that's a that's a key thing, and that could even be help somebody realize maybe I'm not even converted because I'm just so fearful or gripped by that fear or something that I realize now I have no trust in God right now, and they they can sense that, right? Yeah, that's good. Um, um sorry. Yeah, you know, and just being maybe even in a pattern of sin, um, not wanting to be caught or found out can be can lead to anxiety and fear, right? Um, even with you know, um, with just a maybe not even having a fear of God, but some people who are in a caught in, or they're in some sort of unrepentant sin. They're afraid of being caught. They're anxious of being caught just by another person, maybe by their spouse or by a friend or a coworker or someone else in the church. That can cause anxiety and fear in their in their heart as well, right? Um, again, and 
Matthew 6, 27, being anxious and fearful doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the situation. It doesn't accomplish anything worthwhile. Um, being anxious doesn't fix anything. It doesn't do anything. Uh, we're seeking to trust in and hold on to some sort of control we have in the situation, which is why we're anxious, because we don't have that. And our anxiety shows us again how really just how helpless and how dependent we part we are upon God. It's really that's one helpful thing about being anxious at times, is it just shows our helplessness and our utter dependence upon God. God, of course I'm anxious. I can't control this thing. I can't do that. I can't make this situation go away. I can't heal that person. I can't do anything other than trust in you. Sitting there being anxious about what I'm going to do it does nothing. And it takes away all the energy that we should have and that we should spend on trusting God and coming up with a solution to maybe maybe there's a way out of the situation. That's fine. I, what, what energy should I be putting into coming up with um, a response to whatever the situation may be? Maybe it's not a solution, but just a response. How should I respond? in action or in thinking about this situation rather than sitting there and letting all that energy drain out of me in my anxiety and fear. Um, again, anxiety and fear are always engaged in loving something other than God in Matthew 6, that we are loving either money or loving something else, that we are seeking for my own kingdom rather than God's kingdom or loving, or fearing, or desiring, rather, something else other than God. What we fear often shows what we worship. Um, we understand that. Talk about worship quite a lot um, in this, uh, in these classes. But again, what we fear often shows what we are worship, what we're desiring, what we're worshiping. Um, um, again, because we're in a live scene in control from our perspective, things are going how we um, how we think they should. We have some sort of peace in our lives then because of that. But when circumstances change, then we become anxious and fearful because those um, our life is no longer going the way that we thought. Maybe a job, again, a, our health, our house bank accounts, these sort of things, when all those things are taken away, the things we used to find comfort in and, and sort of rest in and, and sort of a sense of peace in, those things are taken away, then our hearts are exposed to how are we thinking about these things? How are we really trusting in God or what they trusting in my wealth, trusting in my ability to communicate, trusting my ability to work hard or whatever it is? Right. Again, you can even think about this like, like with guilt, anxiety, or fear can be sort of like a smoke alarm. Something's wrong. If I'm anxious or fearful, may, something's wrong. I, I, It's not like I need, I need to go and, you know, I don't want to say this in a way that's just unnecessarily foolish, but I don't, I don't need to necessarily go and just go to the doctor and get some sort of medication to make me feel better. That's not necessarily the case. Maybe it's, I need to be thinking more about what am I desiring? Am I desiring something? Am I really worshiping something that's that, that's now being rooted out or taken away or stripped away such that I'm now I feel out of control here or I feel um again all this all this anxiety and fear maybe what's going on in my heart such that I'm responding in this way and again there can be physical situations that can that, that can uh, make anxiety more physically hard and more physically just draining I, I get that but scripture says the root issue though with anxiety is it's going to be linked to our hearts. It's going to be linked to our worship, according to Matthew 6 here, and then even Philippians 4. And no matter how much our physical nature is is related to that, it doesn't really matter because it's a, it's primarily a matter of the heart. Right? Um, uh, look at the quote there from Dale Johnson. Um, Dale Johnson is the executive director of ACBC under, under Roman numeral four there. Um, he said this, that uh, fear is a symptom that demonstrates that we have been trusting in the wrong thing, right? 
And again, that's helpful. Fear is a symptom we're trusting the wrong thing. Right? Rather than in, 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 in God, we're trusting in ourselves, we're trusting in something else. Well, then hope comes then from seeing our, our anxiety as sin, as an offense against God, rather than something else. Hope comes from that, that seeing anxiety and fear, that sort of fear is, 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 a, is sin. Not hope in the sense of, oh, look at me, I'm sinning, but hope in the, in the sense of, well, now I can deal with it. That when, when sin's exposed, there, that we know there's a way out. God's given us a way out of that. We see, first and foremost, obviously, the gospel. We don't need, we don't need to necessarily just cope with anxiety, uh, but the gospel helps us to be victorious over that anxiety and over that fear. Um, if God has commanded us not to be anxious, then he has given us the resources in his word through the spirit by the grace of Christ to overcome it and to deal with it and to grow in, in our anxiety. Does that mean that we will never be anxious people? No, not necessarily. Some people are going to be more tended to being anxious as a response to things for maybe their entire Christian life. That doesn't mean that they're weak and immature and foolish Christians. It just means that's their struggle. But God is continuing to root that out um, in various different ways. And they're still, and we're still commanded to repent of that and to deal with that and to grow in trusting the Lord in these things. Um, I used to be way more anxious than I am now. I think this is an issue that I will probably have for you know for the rest of my life just because. It was, uh, I don't know, I mean, maybe not, but um, <clears throat> I think we all, we can all tend to struggle with anxiety in di different ways. But again, the Lord puts me in situations often uh, where I'm realizing just how weak I am and how much I need to grow in trusting him. Um, thankfully, when I am anxious, it, it's not as debilitating as it, as, it, as it was. It's not really debilitating at all, actually. Uh, but it's, it's still there. There's, there's still moments of anxiety and just fear. What am I going to do? Um, how, how's this gonna, uh, gonna play out? But I need to, that, those are the moments that the Lord reminds me, you need to trust me. You need to cling to me and not to yourself. Okay. Does that make sense? Any thoughts or questions about that? Um, well, the heart then of anxiety and fear, a uh, letter, or uh, letter. <laughs> Uh, number three, um, number three there, um, the heart of anxiety and fear. Again, a biblical view of why we do what we do, Again, the issues of the heart. Got Mark 7, everything we do proceeds from the heart. Proverbs 4, 23, Jeremiah 17, 9, Hebrews 4, those verses. Um, three of them were all mentioned yesterday in the sermon, I think, or at least two of them, um, maybe all three. Um, right. So again, why do we do what we do? Because of the heart, because of our desires, because of our worship. In the heart, biblically speaking, as we talked about many times before, is the mind, the will, the emotions, this inner man, so on. Um, I, I have this in here just because it, this is sort of a, this was part of a, uh, like a separate seminar I did once on anxiety and fear. And so I had to talk about the heart in that context. Uh, but for our purposes, I'm just kind of skipping through that because we've spent so much time discussing it, um, right? Again, the heart's not fundamentally good, but if we're a new creature in Christ, we'd be given a new heart to obey, to repent of our sin, to obey Christ now, to obey his word, the spirit now indwells us, um, right? But there's still remnants sin there. Our hearts are not passive. They're alive. Again, Hebrews 4.12, they're active. Um, our hearts are active. There's thoughts. There's intentionality there. Proverbs 20, verse 5, it takes a work to understand. Uh, the heart of a man is like a deep well or deep water, but a man of understanding draws it out, right? So our hearts are uh, the mission control center of what we do and why we do certain things, right? It's about worship, as I mentioned there, um, and as we talked about before. Uh, there's a chart there about things we can maybe tend to fear more than we fear God or things that we may want or love more than we fear God as a result of that. So maybe if we fear a man, 
we have a fear of man. It could be because we love man's approval more than God and God's approval. Maybe if we fear in unwanted circumstances, it could be because we are loving or worshiping an evil life or life of comfort with no pain and just um, kind of spiritual Disneyland uh, all the time. Uh, if we fear maybe losing someone or something dear to us, it could maybe because we're worshiping and we're loving money or health or a job or we're loving certain people or things more than we're wanting to love and honor God. Again, those things aren't necessarily bad, right? But maybe we're loving those things more. If we fear bodily harm, again, there's wisdom in that at times, right? Uh, but maybe if we don't ever go outside or these sort of things, right, we're gripped by fear. Maybe it's because we are worshiping and loving the idea of safety and no pain in life more than we are seeking to worship and love and, and honor Christ, right? And there's more we could talk about. Those are just kind of, those are just some examples. Um, I, next there, just kind of some questions. Um, what are some, quite, some good questions to ask to get to get really to the root of our anxiety and fear? How can we determine maybe what we're desiring? What's the heart issue, the root issue here? Um, what are some good questions to shepherd people by? And, and so here's just a, some you know, some examples that I've thought of and things I've used in the past to myself and others. Again, what are you anxious or fearful about? Obviously, ask them that. What are you anxious or what are you fearful about? Um, uh, you know, maybe are you afraid of running out of, um, you know, again, during COVID, it was, are you afraid of running out of food, toilet paper? Okay, but that's, it, there's a deeper issue than that. You're not just afraid of running out of food. Um, why are you afraid of running out of food? Why are you afraid of these things? Well, maybe a fear of dying, a fear of sickness, a fear of discomfort, right? Um, it's typically not just the main thing. I think I'm fearful about this. It's, there's typically maybe a deeper level to that. Um, maybe for some people, I'm afraid to lose my job. Well, why? Okay, well, I'm not going to be able to provide my family, these sort of things. Okay, that's great. Or maybe it's well because if I lose my job, man, I'm just going to look like a real loser in front of my friends. Okay, well, that's, that's probably, I mean, that, that, that's, that's more of a fear of man there. And then uh, a desire to honor God and to work hard to provide for your family, right? So there's could be different motivations for different people. Another question is again: Recall the last few times you were fearful, the last few times that you were really anxious about something that was just hard. What happened? How did you respond? What did you do, or what did you not do? Right? Again, how was how was the response? Um, how did how did you respond to that situation? Uh, what led to that fear? You know, maybe. Maybe, um, you know, their response really showed that they ran to um, entertainment as a source of distraction and comfort rather than doing what they should have been doing. Or, you know, they didn't run to the word of God or they didn't um, seek help that they should have in certain situations. Right. Another question again, what were the results of your anxiety or fear? Meaning what happened? Did it did your anxiety or fear fix anything? Obviously, the answer is no. Um, maybe you were more fearful. You were more anxious. Uh, again, you ran to these things for comfort. You that led to these other sins. It led to, um, you know, maybe looking at um, pornography or or or, or, or a, a, a sinful relationship because you were running to something for for comfort and for for pleasure. Um, some irresponsibility took place because of a response of our fear. Um, again, at times I can be tempted to do that when I'm just anxious about something, things are just hard, I'm not sure what to do. I can be tempted to just be irresponsible and not love my kids and shepherd my family during that time. That's, that's ir I'm being sinful. Uh, not only am I being anxious uh, in that sin, but I'm not responsibly loving and shepherding my family. Right. Um, and so it, it can go, you know, it, you can just go down those kind of questions and help people to root out and to see how their fear affects not just them, but it affects everyone around them. And it affects a lot of their different decisions and why certain decisions were even made, right? Another question, letter D there, again, how are you not trusting God in those moments? God says he's gonna provide for you. Um, again, not that you can't work hard, but maybe you weren't working hard. 
maybe part of you trusting God is working hard in your job, right? Part of you trusting God is working hard in, in, in that job he's given to you um, to provide, right? Um, how are you not trusting the Lord in those moments of, of fear and anxiety? Um, how are you, how do you need to grow and, and trusting in God and seeing he is our good loving father and he's the control of all situations and all circumstances. And he's called us to obedience and, and, and trust in certain ways. Right. Um, again, we need to be careful of not placing promises upon God. He hasn't promised us. God has not promised us that we will never go without food. God's never promised us that life will always be easy. God's not promised us that things won't be hard. Um, especially as believers, God's not promised us that a believer will never go to jail. God's not promised us a lot of things that we take for granted. Um, and he has just provided for us in just incredible ways. Um, but he has promised that in, in the midst of those situations, he will give us peace, Philippians 4. God, has, God has promised, I can't even talk right now, that he um, will be with us, Psalm 46, 1, 2. God has promised that he will sanctify us through those trials. God has promised that um, you know, one day we will be with him in heaven. Um, it is those promises we need to cling to, not just the um, temporary things that maybe we uh, be tempted to focus on. By right, then, letter E, and what, what are things that typically lead to anxiety and fear? Again, you can come up with more on your own. Um, but um, just some examples here. Um, oh, wait, no, I don't have examples. <laughs> Uh, sorry, that's another question to ask somebody. Never mind. Jeez. Uh, I was in the notes. Again, ask somebody good examples of those things. Um, and then Seth, kind of in line of your question, are, are, this letter F, are you, or not your question, but your comment, um, asking somebody this, are you confident that it, you're in right standing with God? Are you confident of that? Maybe that's why you're anxious. What do you base your confidence on, right? What do you base that confidence on in the Lord? Um they are in Christ. So maybe you're anxious. You think you're saved, but you have no, your basis for confidence is maybe upon yourself rather than on the finished work of Christ. Right. All this, this other question, do you have any unconfessed sin in your life? Sometimes I ask people that, do you have any unconfessed sin? And they'll, they'll like, yeah, you know, I was kind of waiting for you to ask me that. <laughs> we should have just confessed it. Don't wait for me to ask. <laughs> this could have saved a lot of time. Uh, that can be part of that as well. They're anxious and fearful because they have a sin that they're holding on to. I don't really say that to them. I'm like, you should have wasted my time. I'm not saying that to people. Um, in my mind, maybe I'm thinking that. Um, but for some, it could be they have this unconfessed sin that's just led to this life of fear because they're not in a right relationship with the Lord in that moment. Right, then what, another question I'd like to ask people is, what do you want you're not getting or what are you getting that you don't want? So it's a led you to the anxiety, things that led you to that fear, those sort of things, right? Um, well, then how do we change? What do we do about it? Um, again, this isn't the only way in the sense of like, this isn't like the method by which you do that step by step, but these are just biblical principles. Um, first, again, we need to make sure we're saved. Make sure that we're trusting in the Lord. Secondly, we make sure that we confess our sin and repent of that sin and, and acknowledge that anxiety and sinful fear are, are, are sins, not just blame shifting them or not just saying it's not that big of a deal, but it's there, it's sin, it's a lack of trust in God. I, I think that's critical for us to understand that, to help people understand that. If we're to if we're to over be overcome uh, or to overcome our anxiety. We need to acknowledge that it's that there's sin there. There's a lack of trust in the Lord. There's a trust in ourselves that needs to be dealt with. Um, all right. So for some people, being told that anxiety is sin is new. They've never been told that. Um, I remember the first time I realized anxiety was sin, and I was like blown away. I was uh, I was just about to go to master's. And I, I, when I, I, I visited the campus, I kind of get a tour and kind of check things out before I, I showed up to move in. 
I got a booklet called What to Do When You're Anxious. Um, so or a little pamphlet, What to Do When You're Anxious. And I was reading through it. I was just like, what? This says anxiety is sin. And I had like no clue. Um, and, uh, but it like clicked and made sense. I was like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, because I'm not trusting in God, trusting in me. Anyway, I, I, I remember that pretty vividly. Um, for some people, again, that's new for them. They've never been told that, that there's freedom in seeing that this is sin because God's provided a way out. First Corinthians 10, 13, God's provided a way of escape through repentance, faith in Christ. Um, we need to help people not only to confess their sin to repent of it, but, but then also pray. Again, repentance, as we talked about before, it's not just I repent. It's, just not, it's not just saying I repent. There's demonstration of the repentance, right? There's obedience there, but part of that obedience will look like, let us see here, praying, praying to God. Typically, anxious people are not prayer for people. They're not praying. Prayer shows you dependent upon Christ or dependent upon God and not yourself. You're dependent upon his help and his strength rather than your own. And you, we can't emphasize this enough with ourselves, our own hearts, um, and with other people that you need to pray. Philippians 4, 6, pray. Don't be anxious, but pray. I mean, that's pretty clear. Don't be anxious, but pray. Be thankful. Go to God. You don't want to tell somebody just stop being anxious, but hey, God says don't be anxious. Instead, pray to him. Trust in him. Think rightly, verse 8, Philippians 4, verse 8. Think correctly. Think biblically. Right? Um, You know, he says, Paul says, to pray with the heart of thanksgiving, Philippians 4, 6, um, <clears throat> as well. And even thanking God for the trial, thanking God for the situation, thanking God for revealing that sin. Thank you, Lord, for revealing the sin to me. This is hard, but thank you that you've revealed the sin. So let me work on it, repent of it, and be more mature as a result of it. You know, all those things, being thankful, making a thankfulness list. I'm thankful for, you know, my house, where I live, my car, food. Covering, I'm thankful for these relationships. I'm thankful for these things. Just being thankful for everything rather than being anxious about things and fearful about things. Right? It gets, it's a renewing of our mind. It's, it's a thinking correctly. And part of that correction is, as Paul says, is to be thankful. Right? Um, I have in there Philippians 2, 12, 13. Um, <clears throat> Not only again do we need to pray, but also part of that prayer and part of that process of repentance is just being making sure we're being obedient to the Lord. We're trusted in God to grow us, to mature us, but we're also doing our part in the sense of the sanctification effort of honoring God and fearing God. Right. A letter D uh, again help people in your in yourselves to renew thoughts, to be thankful, to be helpful, trusting, loving, and God loving others. Um and turn those new thoughts even into prayers, um, so on. Um, again, thoughts that need to be dwelt on. Philippians four eight. Just think, this is very helpful. At times, I've 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 given people um, like a little diagram of uh, Philippians four eight. Or I kind of go through each one of those words: true, honorable, right, pure, and so on. And I say, here's what the word means. What are you thinking on that's not this? And how should you be thinking correctly in this situation? Um, if I'm not thinking that things are true, well, what's true about God? What's true about this situation? Right? And then making a list of those things, making a list of, of the attributes of God, making a list of the ways that God's provided and cared for you so that you're again, not dwelling on the circumstances, but dwelling on the goodness and character and provision of and promises of God. Um, again, we want to dwell on these things. It's not just a, a quick, fleeting moment. It's a constant kind of dwelling on, on those truths rather than on our ang anxious thoughts. And maybe it's somebody, you know, if you're like me at times, it's maybe 50 times a day. You have to tell yourself to stop thinking ang anxious thoughts and trust in God, whatever the situation may be. <clears throat> it's not just, well, I was anxious and, and God didn't help me because I prayed for him for like a couple minutes and nothing happened. Well, we have to put some more effort into, into thinking correctly, thinking rightly. 
more prayer. Right? Um, we have to remember God's sovereignty as well. Pe helping people remember God's sovereignty in all things, as we talked about last week. Remember God's grace is sufficient in times of trouble. Again, we mentioned that last week as well. Um, <clears throat> in our time, in our study of um, trials and suffering, we need to increase our faith and trust in the Lord by study, by prayer, and committing to love God. Um, <clears throat> At times, we need to just spend more time in studying maybe just the attributes of God, um, which can be just necessary for us just to grow in a greater knowledge of God. Um, uh, where is it? <clears throat> That's not it. Oh. <clears throat> so this book, Puritan Paperback, by George Swinnick, he's a Puritan. Um, he wrote a book called The Incomparableness of God. Um, <clears throat> there's a summary book um, called uh, uh, The Blessed and The Blessed and Boundless God. Um, it's sort of a summary of this, but it's, this isn't very thick. Um, and uh, it's just, it's helpful. I mean, these chapters are fairly short, but it goes through different character, um, characteristics of God, different attributes of God that are, uh, that are just helpful. Um, talk about his incomparableness in his, in his love and his purity and his mystery and his greatness in, um, in his knowledge and, and these sort of things. It's just, it's just helpful. His attributes, his holiness, his wisdom, his, his eternality his patience, his mercy. It's just, it's just helpful. It's just such a, uh, a rich um, way to think you know, that if I'm anxious, it's because I have a low view of God. So how can I grow my knowledge of God in those moments? And even giving somebody a book like this, it's just, it's easy to read. Um, it's, it, he's very readable. Um, some Puritans like John Owen are kind of harder to read. This guy is really easy to read, um, even though I think this is modernized, uh, modern English. It might not be. Um, if it's not, it reads like it's modern English. It's really, it's really easy to read. Um, so things like that, I think, can be just really, really helpful. Um, and as a result of thinking rightly, Philippians 4, as a result of putting on truth, the result of praying, and as a result of... Um, these things, God says his peace will be with us. Again, as I mentioned this sermon yesterday, what does it look like? It's beyond understanding. It's beyond human reason. It's sort of that somewhat subjective experiential peace that only comes first because we have the peace with God that we're saved, and then we are going to him in prayer, and he gives us his peace in some sort of supernatural way that in very difficult, stressful situations, we can have a, a settled joy and a settled peace and trust in the Lord when the world is just sort of in chaos and, and anxiety around us. Right? Another thing we want to help other people to do is <clears throat> they can memorize certain scriptures. Um, right? We want to um, make sure we're thinking rightly and that comes from meditation and memory of God's word. Um, there's certain verses there. Obviously, there's more. These are just ones that I think were helpful for me. The ones I wrote down there. Um, <clears throat> you can make yourself dwell on right thoughts, appropriate verses, and just other uh, bunch of stuff we've already talked about. Um, think on true thoughts, profitable thoughts. You know, what can I do now? How can I obey now? Rather than what am I going to do in 10 years or in six months? What can I do now? How can I obey God now? These sort of things. Um, don't also let her, uh, G there, don't only seek, I don't, I'm not saying don't seek, but don't only seek to be removed from the trial that's causing that fear and anxiety. Because again, God may be using that to transform us and we don't want to just help me get out of this so my life's easier, but how is God going to grow me and maybe mature me uh, through this, right? Um, I have some other notes are about that. Um, And be alert, be ready, be self-controlled, do battle with your thoughts. Because maybe, you know, these anxious thoughts can come. 
when we're least expecting it, when things are seemingly going easy, something may happen and we become anxious again. Be, be on alert that we're just always, always on the ready, that we're always um, seeking the Lord, we're seeking to be in prayer, um, have peace with him uh, during these, during times of trial and difficulty, right? Um, I have a list there uh, of other helpful things that people can do that maybe other, other people do, just a list of kind of homework assignments, some other books to read, um, things to listen to, uh, music to listen to. Um, sometimes when we're anxious, we, it's helpful to read biographies of people who have gone through similar things or, or um, harder situations and seeing how do they trust the Lord, how did God come to their aid? How did God, um, how's God promises um, um, help them and those sort of things can be, can be a, a great source of, uh, of help as well. Um, uh, but yeah, and that's just, you know, there's more, there's more we could say to that, but that's sort of a, a quick, a quick way I've done some like seminars on anxiety and fear in the past. Um, but any thoughts on some of that, any questions? In your uh, background of counseling, do you get a lot of cases of anxiety? Yeah, a lot. Um, even in marriage kind of counseling, um, there, you know, one or sometimes both spouses will, will sometimes bring up, well, I'm anxious about this. Uh, I'm worried about maybe this thing. Um, it's probably one of the top issues I, I address with people is anxiety. Is, is there uh, a common thing, money, um, certain, is that like a common thing or is there other things that no, you see so a lot No, that's a good question. Um, no, it's not, I don't see a lot of just commonalities in the sense of like, yeah, it's, oftentimes it's money or it's um, <clears throat> a job or <clears throat> certain things. Um, you know, a recent kind of situation, somebody's anxious about, well, if I, uh, how can I respond in a way to an unbelieving spouse such that like they won't make life harder to me? If I, <clears throat> I'm anxious that their response to me um, is, good, is just going to make things more difficult as I try to like honor God and obey God. Right. So there's, there's some of that. It could be some anxiety. Well, <clears throat> I'm anxious of, uh, some people are anxious over their money, over their wealth, over um, how am I going to provide? Uh, how am I going to take care of myself and my family? Um, you know, others are anxious about things, a variety of different things. Yeah. But oftentimes it comes down to, again, a, a love of, <clears throat> maybe comfort or there's a love of control of things. And so because I, I can't control this situation, um, this circumstance, there's a there's a sense of being anxious about it uh, because I can't uh, can't control as much as I want to. Um, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just asking uh, when we were counseling or when you're counseling someone who's experienced something traumatic, in the mm -hmm. sense of something really hard and where you're counseling them, and there's obviously an extensive time. When do you kind of, I guess, how do we approach it biblically of, of are they, you know, of the thing that they experience yet, they're still like, there's this kind of, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like this continual, like uh, thinking of like, as time has gone, as you've counseled them, I guess, of kind of navigating that. Um, so uh, I guess I, I just forgot the first part of your question. <laughs> Sorry, man. Uh, as I was about to answer, like, what did you, what was the first part of your question that you asked? Oh, sorry. I was just asking if someone's experienced something like traumatic in a sense and how we counsel them traumatic. biblically and then how do we then kind of decipher and have yeah. discernment 
of them yeah. maybe this um them continue thinking of it, thinking of it consciously <clears throat> um you know kind of navigating that of the, that fear yeah yes that's good so kind of like uh you know, you know post-traumatic stress right um obviously i think there's a degree in which pts not ptsd i don't think it's a disorder post-traumatic stress is obviously it's a real thing that people aren't making it up um <clears throat> however i think oftentimes it it is um you get labeled a disorder it's labeled something in your brain but oftentimes it's a response to, again, fearful thoughts, fearful things, <clears throat> very difficult, stressful situations, whether it be a car accident, you know, some of the military um, <clears throat> abusive situations, um, <clears throat> whether from a childhood or, or a marriage or something like that, that, uh, again, is going to be related to their thinking. Um, does it mean it's not hard? Does it mean it's not real? No, it's, it's very real. But God <clears throat> has not left us alone in this situation. So how can we look to the word of God to help somebody who's gone through combat, who has had to, who's had to kill people, or he's seen his friends blown up next to him, um, or killed right next to them? And that's hard. Or somebody's a car accident and seen their entire family killed, except for them. You know, there's like going to be a lot of thoughts running through their mind that they are going to need to um, take captive. You know, in those situations, obviously, we're patient, we're, we're understanding, <clears throat> uh, we're not uh, obviously uncompassionate to those situations. So those are just hard. Those are extreme kind of crises sort of moments, right? But I think we deal with it the same way. I, I don't think we need to come up with, well, because that's a special case, we don't, it's PTSD is not in the Bible. Well, it, it is in the sense of fear, right? And just thinking correctly. Um, <clears throat> You know, some people might say you're too simplistic. Well, I, I think the Bible is just pretty clear on that. Um, again, not not to say by way of example, because examples aren't aren't uh, aren't authoritative. But um, you know, there's a, there's a guy I know. Um, he's sort of um, he's not quite a friend. So I've never met him in person. He's an acquaintance of mine, a uh, fellow biblical counselor. He's kind of a he's in charge of his count. He's a counseling ministry at his church. He is a combat veteran. <clears throat> um, you know, saw he's a Marine, saw battle, saw war, um, got out and just was, even in the midst of that, he was just drinking a lot, doing drugs and just ruining his life, going to doctors for um, PTSD stuff, doing EMDR therapy, doing shock treatments and these sort of things, and nothing helped. Um, and then he gets saved, he gets converted and realizes like the Bible has the answers and it ra drastically changes his thinking. And uh he is um he writes a lot about this um this whole idea and from, i think from a very biblical point of view and he's been through it he's he's not only been through very traumatic experiences that what many of us will never go through he's done the secular therapies the christianized version of those therapies he's done and he's seen the the, the power of the bible the word of god um at work in his life and <clears throat> again that's a that's a um a subjective example but um, you know, I, I hear I hear of those often, um, and uh, again, it's just, it is it is helpful to see how did the Word of God help somebody in that sort of situation. Um, and he, you know, I'm sure he still struggles at times and still has difficult uh, thoughts at times because of uh, past memories. But he he goes to the Word of God uh, and he clings to the promises of, of God and his word and rather than to other therapies or other ideas. But he, you know, it's the same process that we just talked about. It's thinking rightly, thinking about God's sovereignty, thinking about God's care, thinking about how, how did God use those circumstances to bring you to faith or to reveal sin or to help me to be a minister to others. Again, this guy now, because of his situation, he's now able to minister to others in a, in a, in a unique way that I wouldn't be able to. He's able to minister to them in, in, in just different ways that he never would have before. So all those ways of thinking are just going to be, uh, are just how we need to gently shepherd people and, and how to think. Sorry, is that, is that going to answer that question? No. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to make sure I was looking at it in a biblical sense, obviously, where I'm at. I've seen, obviously, the um, rotten approach, if I'm just being honest, use a word of. Sure. And so I guess for me, would it also be helpful in the sense of 
uh, like going through obviously discourses where we see, for example, like the apostle Paul in his ministry, obviously not comparing like his situations worse than theirs, but showing this um, yeah. sense of, you know, of, I mean, physical hurt to then mm -hmm. see the power of the word of God and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so that's a great example of even turn opening to second Corinthians 12 and saying, let's look at the, or 11, chapter 11. And saying, let, let's look at the apostle Paul. Cause some people say, trauma is not in the bible and i think they have not read the bible um trauma is all over the bible jesus paul um uh jonah well jonah's not a good example um uh the prophets jeremiah jeremiah was like thrown into a pit and almost died uh that's traumatic um you know many others uh, you get the uh joseph she's yeah joseph that's a big one um, you know, many others you can see it, but even you know, going to the Apostle Paul of okay, how did he respond? How does he deal with it? Did he sin? Probably. I'm sure he did. He was human, right? But you look at that list in 2 Corinthians 11, see all the things he suffered, all the things he went through. And then chapter 12, I pled with God to take away this trial, take away this hardship. And he said, No, my grace is sufficient. Okay, I'm going to boast my weakness. That's his response. I'm going to trust in God. I'm a wretched sinner. Okay. <laughs> um, right. That, that's his response. So helping people to see, yeah, traumatic events from the Bible. And how does God reveal his grace to us in that? How did Paul think through that? Paul saw it as this is a means of my sanctification. Paul saw that the, those trials as a means of rooting out his sin and helping him to become humble. As he says in there twice in the same verse in 2 Corinthians 12, God gave me this so I don't boast of myself, so I don't think highly of myself. God gave maybe a demonically possessed man or just some false teacher, some false prophet to the church of Corinth. He, he, God allowed that to happen. God put that situation in that church uh, for Paul to be humble. That's how Paul had to think about it. And for us, that's how we should think about it. Why would God put me through this? I don't know all the reasons why. But we do know this that God is good, God's loving, and God's not, He says He does not willingly afflict the sons of men, meaning He's not just up there like, haha, this is so fun. I'm so glad I can I can make you feel pain. No, He's not doing that. God's good, loving, kind, merciful, gracious, He's sovereign, He's in control. Okay, so those things are true. So this is hard. This is painful. This is tragic. I don't know if I'm ever, I'm ever going like, to think rightly about this. I don't know if, ever, I'm, if I'm ever going to get over this. Okay, but what might God be doing through this? How might God be trying to mature me and grow me through this? And maybe it's just a greater trust in him. Maybe it's just a, I need to be humble. I need to not be, think so highly of myself. And if that's all God does, then, then I need to praise him for that. That's what Paul did. And Paul's a man like us. He is a man like us. So it, it's easy. Maybe it sounds easy for me to say that. Um, but that's honestly how I have to think a lot. I have to think that way a lot. Uh, through just my own physical trial, through my wife's trials, other stuff. Uh, so I think this is what God wants for me right now. And I need to not just not just resign like a stoic. Well, I think this is this is what God has. So okay, I need to trust in Him. I just need to not be anxious and try to fight against this, kick against the goad, so to speak. I can't do that. But I need to be resolved that this is what God has in light of His character and how He promised to sanctify me through whatever trial it is. So. Good. Again, and that can be hard. It, it might it may take a long time for somebody to come to that understanding. That's fine. Just be patient with people, walk alongside them, not force them to come to grips with it. Say you need to believe this right now, or you like sinning. I mean, we're all in process there. It's it can take time. It can take weeks. It can take months for somebody to maybe come to this understanding as they're being saturated and reading through the word. Right. 
Okay. Um, let me take a uh, two minute break, use the rest for something, grab something to drink, come back, we'll talk about anger. All right, see you guys in a few minutes. This to say it's seven, what is it? Seven, 7.30, 7.30, we'll come back. Um, oh, another book uh, called Uprooting Anger by Robert Jones is also helpful um, as well. It's in the notes there. Yeah. Um, the Heart of Anger by Lou Priolo. Uh, that's that's more for um, it's more for kids uh, or for how, for you to help kids with their anger. Um, it's it's geared towards um, parents helping their kids to deal with their um, anger, to deal with the kids' anger. Uh, that's a helpful helpful resource there as well. But Upward and Anger by Robert Jones is helpful. Anger Resource Management by Wayne Mack are more for uh, adults. Give it just helpful, um, helpful resources there. Um, again, anger is one of the things that in our world is seen as, again, this is the thing. I have an anger problem, like this, like I have an, ang I have an anxiety problem or I have an anger problem. Uh, the thing is with anger, again, it's, it's not that thing that is the problem in and of itself. It's our response to something else. Right, so a good definition of what is anger, um, again, because anger can be good. Anger can also be bad. But so anger, just a general definition is this, it's a whole person to response arising from negative moral judgment against perceived evil. In perceived evil, it could be right, it could be wrong. But it's a whole person response, like it's an emotional response um, arising from a negative moral judgment against perceived evil. So you're perceiving something as wrong. Again, you're, you're given a, a judgment about that, and then the judgment is it's wrong. It's There's sin there, right? So that, that's what's talking about, the negative moral judgment. <clears throat> All right, so anger is something um, that people do, not something that people have, because anger is just like anxiety and fear arises from our hearts. Anger is always a response to something. It never arises just out of any, out of nowhere. Like, oh, I don't know why I got so angry. And maybe you don't, but there's always something behind that um, anger. It doesn't just come out of, out of the blue. Um, no one sins in a vacuum, so to speak. And so <clears throat> uh, there's anger it always comes from some sort of response. Um, Again, anger is always a moral judgment because it, it, it's saying what you did was wrong, and I'm going to judge you for that. This this I this thing you did needs to stop. This uh, this statement needs to stop. This, these words or this action you're doing needs to stop, and you need to be punished for it. Anger arises from our value systems. It arises it arises from our beliefs, our motivations. Maybe not getting what we wanted, not getting what we desired. And so we respond in anger because we think it's unfair or unjust or whatever, right? Um, and so that's sort of a kind of a, a brief intro there. Um, looking at a couple of different types of anger, you have divine anger. This is God's anger towards man. Um, Psalm 7 verse 11 says God is um, an angry God, like he is vengeance. God has God expresses his anger and vengeance. Um, John 3 says that God's going to judge the world. There's anger there. That's divine anger. It's divine wrath. Right. In Romans 1 and Romans 2, we talked about that um, over the past couple of years in our study in Romans, <clears throat> that there's judgment from God for sin. Right? There's punishment from God for sin. Um, divine anger is also seen on the cross because Christ was punished. Or sin, right? God obviously perceives all evil and sin with perfect accuracy. We don't, but God does. God's anger is always just, right? Ours is sometimes <laughs> just. Um, so there's divine anger. Then there's righteous anger. Again, this is a negative response to evil that we accurately are perceiving as evil, right? There's there's a there's a a, a judgment that we can have against things that are wrong that are rightly wrong um you know some examples of that in our society uh could be 
uh, you know, transgender movement. That's wrong. It's sinful. We can have a righteous anger about that in our uh, in our thinking. That can quickly lead, though, to sin. Um, sinful anger. <laughs> it's uh, the right judgment, but it can lead to just sin in multiple different ways. Um, right. So there's. Uh, there's there's negative responses to evil that we accurately perceive as wrong that yet we can still quickly turn to um, uh, sinful anger there. Um, you know, Ephesians 4, 26 says, be angry and yet do not sin. Okay, so there's some some sort of way in which we are called to express that anger or called to express that response to a moral evil in a way that is not sinful um, in some sort of way. Now, how do we distinguish the righteous anger versus non-righteous? Again, I have that there. Righteous anger is going to be accompanied by these things. Again, the reaction against, it's a, it's a reaction against actual sin, not personal preferences. Some people say, I have righteous anger. I have a right to be angry because they sinned in this way. I'm like, that's not even a sin. That's a preference issue. You have no right to be angry. What are you talking about? And plus you're yelling. That's sin. Stop it. Um, but righteous anger is always against actual sin. It's objective. There's actual sin. Secondly, righteous anger only focuses on God and his kingdom and his concerns and not me and my kingdom or my concern. How do we see that? We primarily see that in the example of Christ. And when he, well, Jesus flipped over the, 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 the you know, the, the table in the, in the temple. He was angry. It's okay for me to be angry. Well, okay. Yes, Jesus did that twice. Well, why did he do that? Because he, people were sinning against him? No. Why did Jesus do that? Because they were turning the temple into a den of thieves. They were using that as a means of gaining wealth. And he was angry at their sin and rebellion against, against God, against the Father, causing, um, not allowing the people to worship God as they ought to. And so they were using the temple as a means of gain. So Jesus wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about the Father and his kingdom, um, and not what is personally happening to him. Right? There's no sin there in Jesus' part. And if uh, we're the son of God and we go into a temple and, and they're doing those sort of things, sure, we can flip over tables too. Um, all right, we don't, we're not going to go into the church and flip over the book table. That's not, that's not what we should do. Um, you know, there's going to be other instances where we can see righteous anger maybe coming out. But we got to be careful. Many people justify their anger and say it's righteous because there's maybe there's real sin there, but... It is directed at it's it's at me. It's directed at me, so therefore I have a right to respond in anger. Righteous anger is never going to be accompanied with yelling and screaming and, and frustration, because that's sin. Those responses are sinful. Ephesians four, thirty-one. Right? Let all anger and wrath and clamor and slander and malice be put away from you. And those outbursts of anger, those those wrathful things, Jesus says, don't do that. So that's sin, right? So righteous anger is only is focused on God and his kingdom. Righteous anger also is accompanied by, again, other godly qualities expressed in it itself in other godly ways. Self-control, it's not consuming. You're not just red hot and just, ah, you know, venting and just tense and those sort of things. You're seeking to worship God, not you're not being self-centered. You're seeking repentance and restoration of, of people in sin. There's compassion there. There's not rage. Um, there's not withdrawing, self-pity, arrogance, and these sort of things. You're not concerned with self-retaliation or self-defense and self-protection. Those won't be part of the idea of righteous anger. Why do you know that? Because those things are just wrong in and of themselves, right? So we, we have to be careful there with, I am right, have righteous anger. Maybe, maybe you do for a moment, uh, and then it quickly turns to sin. <laughs> uh, at times I can be right righteous anger towards the soul, you know, towards those who um the judges who want to um legalize or keep keep abortion legal in Wyoming. Um there's like man, those wicked judges, how you know, then it quickly turns into with the idiots. Okay, well that's not compassionate. Uh you know, those sort of those sort of mindsets. 
we, we can just be careful and maybe we need to be wise and, and, uh, and not self-justify uh, certain certain anger right again but so most of the time we're gonna deal with anger it's going to be sinful anger or unrighteous anger um and again like all anger it arises from the heart it arises from perception it arises from motives it arises from a moral judgment that we have um and it could you know it's probably some like everything else is some there's the entrenched desires james one we have something that we don't want, so we respond in anger. That's 4. So we, we have something we don't want, so we respond in anger. Um, <clears throat> we have something in our minds and desires that we are really wanting, and we can't get that, so we respond in a in some sort of angry way. Anger can look like many different things or several different things. There can be kind of that vented anger, that outburst of anger. Um, where, where even the Apostle Paul says that that those who have outbursts of anger, he says, won't inherit the kingdom of God. Meaning like their life is just patterned by outbursts of anger. Not that you sin on occasion by getting, by being angry and having an outbursts, but those who are continually sinning by outbursts of anger probably aren't believers. Why? Because that's the opposite of the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience. It's the opposite of those things. So there's that vented anger, then that slow burn anger. Uh, Ephesians 4, the word there for anger in Ephesians 4.31 is the idea of a slow kind of burn, like, like, like coals in a fire, or it's just simmering. And we throw something on it, and it catches flame real quick. That's that idea. Again, you have the venting, the yelling, screaming, the slandering, the, the, the throwing things, the cursing, telling someone off. Uh, again, the attacking somebody verbally, the hitting. Um, I had somebody once tell me, I think I mentioned this in class before, that um, they, screw, they rolled their windows up in the car and screamed all the things they wanted to yell at their spouse because their therapist told them that that wasn't a good idea to vent their anger. And that's how they like, that's how they dealt with um, forgiveness. He said, I, I for, I've forgiven her. I was like, how, what do you mean? He's like, well, I did this. I was like, that's not forgiven at all. That's sin. Like you, you tried to fix sin with more sin. You tried to fix your sin of anger with more anger. Like what do you, who told you that was okay? And some Christian therapist told him to do that. I, I just, I told, took him to Ephesians 4. I was like, does what does this say? No, like that's not acceptable. It's not forgiveness. <laughs> that's not that's not a biblical or godly way to respond. That, that's a venting of your of your anger. That's a that's a clamoring. <clears throat> that's a that's a that's a yelling of an anger. <clears throat> but then there's a slow burn of uh, you know of being quiet. I'm going to be moody and clanging up. I'm not going to respond. I'm just holding things in or we use the term i'm frustrated or i'm i'm irritated or i'm just disgusted by you you know that kind of that that arrogant attitude or a glaring just like kind of a glaring at somebody with like deadly eyes right or a huffing or a snorting just i'm fine that sort of sort of more of the slow burn that eventually is going to just explode like you you have a nice coals uh, and a fire you put a log on it it's quickly going to catch fire <clears throat> um, my wife had somebody stare at her one time in just a, like a death stare um, uh, because they were just angry at like me. So they glared at my wife in their car. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just sin. <clears throat> you know, so we got to be, we can't justify those things. People will often justify it. Well, I'm just frustrated. I'm not angry. Frustration is anger. Ah, they really irritate me. Uh, that's that's just a fancy word for anger. Because when you define what is irritation, oh, they get on my nerves and they make me think this way. I do that. that you're, it's anger. It's a form of anger. Or it's pride. I'm better than them or whatever. There's anger there. Right? 
So we got to be careful with that and not justify that. Um, obviously, sinful anger displeases God. Um, being angry is not uh, a way that honors God. Uh, I guess as much as people might try to justify that, we need to help them to see that you can't justify that. You can't say God's pleased with me because I'm angry. Um, Proverbs 14, 29, he who is slow to anger has um, great discernment. He who is quick tempered raises up folly. He's a fool. Let's not honor to God to be a fool. Um, there's lots of, I mean, read throughout the Proverbs and you just see so much about anger. Um, I don't have this in this Bible as much. Um, I'm going to start doing that again. One of the things actually I do in my in, in Proverbs, um, I, I need to start doing this Bible. I just haven't. Well, I've done it a few times. Um, so next to like a couple verses, you see I, I put little, little letters. And so what I'll do, I'll have like a key in the beginning of Proverbs of like letters of say A um, for anger uh, and W for like worry, anxiety or something. And so then I'll go through uh, Proverbs and I'll just put letters to a lot of different verses so I can quickly open it up to and see, okay, all these A's are verses on anger. Uh, one, of my, one of my other Bibles has it, it pretty much every, uh, not every verse is listed, but um, a lot of them are. And I haven't really done that with this newer one yet. But um, So like F is for fool, for folly. So I can quickly kind of go to it to see all the different verses talk about anger or foolishness or adultery or uh, drunkenness or something like that. Just kind of a side note. Or like conflict resolution, CR is conflict resolution. Um, so yeah, I need to I need to do that again in this Bible. I have a few, but not a lot. Um again, you can there's so many verses again in Proverbs talk about anger and how it's foolishness, it displeases God, and so on. Um again, how do we identify anger? Um relation spot in there. So this is um, what I was telling you before, kind of one of the list that Apostle Paul gives us of outburst of anger is in the category of those who might not be saved. I mean, Galatians 5. Galatians 5, deeds of the flesh through the spirit, verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, um, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, and just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, is he saying that just because you commit one of those sins means you're no longer saved? No. What he's saying is that those who are characterized by these things, these are the deeds and evidences of the flesh, not of the spirit. That if my life is characterized by idolatry, by outburst of anger, by discreet faction, by sexual immorality, by drunkenness, I'm, I'm probably not converted. Rather, my life needs to be characterized by verse 22, 23, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Am I perfectly manifesting those things? No. But all of those things should be manifested in some degree and growing in my life. And some people might be offended by that. Well, you're saying I'm, I've been I, I've been saved for 20 years and I, I, I still stand, but you're saying I'm not saved because I, I'm just no, not patient at all? Maybe. And what's the worst thing that will happen to you? You get converted. What's the? That's the worst thing that will happen to you if you if you try to realize you're not saved. You, you'll get you'll be converted. That's the worst thing. How bad is that? But the worst thing will happen to you if you don't listen to me. Or really, God's word, not me. The worst thing will happen that if you if you ignore this is that you die and go to hell because you're you're not manifesting the spirit. I had somebody once in counseling not too long ago. I mean, for twenty some years of their marriage, twenty five years of their marriage, there's just been on the husband's part just no patience, just outbursts of anger towards his wife constantly, like almost just daily, trying to address them with it, and even in counseling for several months, and like. Man, like, I just don't see any. There seems to be no desire to actually repent of this and deal with this. There's no heart for the Lord. There's just a kind of like, ah, well, that's just who I am. That's just how I respond. And she does this. 
And I was like, man, where are you at with the Lord? Are you really saved? Because based off of like what you're doing and your responses and not really reading the Bible and doing the, the, some of the assignments I'm asking you to do, it really doesn't seem like you care. And it, didn't, it doesn't really seem like you are fighting to repent of this and like have a desire to repent and to love your wife. It's just kind of like, well, I'll, you know, this is just how I've lived for 30 years. So, I mean, what's the big deal? I provide, I, I go to, I go to work and he's never come back to counseling. Um, and I'm just concerned that, and that he's not a believer and he's stuck in that mindset of, well, I prayed a prayer. And so who are you to tell me? Um, and he may be saved, but there's this, the outburst of anger for him is, is the, uh, that's, that's how he's known by his family and by his wife and his child. And he's distanced his relationship with his, with his child and many of his family members because of his outburst of anger. Um, and it's just sad that that's how many people live the deeds of the flesh, but yet they are also in churches for decades being told that, that, that they're okay. That they're not really being held to account. Again, so anger, um, it's a deed of the flesh. Um, again, if we are angry, we're all angry at times. We're all going to respond in anger. But is that the main characteristic of my life? Is that my natural inclination? Um, and just because we all get angry at certain times doesn't mean it's okay. We need to repent, and God gives us grace to do so. Right? Um, again, anger is natural, obviously, to the human heart. Genesis 6, 5, um, because the heart of man is just deceitful and wicked and prone to evil. Right? Um, Matthew 15 talks about that. Christ talks about the heart. Out of the heart come a abundance of these things, and one of those things is anger. Right? Even Titus 3 says that Part of the, the the natural man or the sinful man before you were in Christ, um, how you used to respond uh, was in anger. Um, Titus three verse three. Oh, it's Second Timothy three. Never mind. Hold on. Um, we're going to we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved. The various lusts and pleasures, spending our time in malice, and that's anger and envy, despicable, hating one another. And that's how we used to, to live pre-Christ, right? BC, if you will, before Christ. That's a pastor's joke, right? Um, before we were saved, we just we were enslaved to, to malice and, and anger and, and hate and, and, and hating each other. That's, that's just, we were gripped by those things. It's natural to the human heart because we're, we're desiring these, uh, desiring certain things. Get anger always involves thoughts and intentions. Proverbs 4, 23. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, speaks about how everything from the heart, everything comes from the heart. Um, the rest of our thoughts. Even Ephesians 4 um, discusses that as well. But everything in, in our hearts, everything, including our anger, is going to involve our thinking. It's going to involve our worship and our, our, our desires. And anger can also be expressed in, in thoughts, obviously, in body language. You can just, you know, or our speech, how we say things and what we do. You know, we don't let the words of our mouth, meditations of our heart be acceptable in his sight. And that's anger is not acceptable in his sight. Uh, yeah. Anger is not just going to be expressed in, in um, our words, but again, in body language and, and, and not saying things and you know, allowing bitterness to take root in our hearts. Um, anger is gonna is also caused by not being able to attain again a prideful goals or selfish goals. James four, I'm gonna respond to anger as I'm not getting something that I want. I'm angry at somebody because they got in my way of me fulfilling my happiness. I'm angry at that guy who cut me off because um, how who do you think who does he think he is that he can he can pull in front of me? The guy who took my parking spot, uh, who does he think he is? That person who took my chair in church. Who do they think they are? How dare they? That's my chair. 
That's my seat. That's my row. Um, I'm angry because my spouse didn't do this for me, even though they knew I had a hard time. I had a hard day. They should have done this for me. I'm angry because, you know, whatever. I didn't get the thing I desired. Some sort of goal was thwarted or something, so I'm angry. Again, Proverbs um, or James 1 20, actually a helpful place. It says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Anger never accomplishes the righteousness of God. Again, as, as parents, again, we can be, um, there can be a sense of that right, righteous anger of our, our kids are sinning and being disobedient and, dis- and rebellious to God. And the anger, and the, you know, self-controlled anger in the sense of that we're, we're, we're sorrowful though over that. Uh, you're not yelling, venting anger with a sort of the righteous anger. That can be part of that. But then it quickly can maybe turn to sinful anger uh, of control or yelling to try to get our kids to obey. Uh, I've never done that, but I've seen parents do that. Uh, just kidding. Um, the, the yelling of my kid to do something isn't going to help them to obey. It may be well for a moment because they're scared because I'm mad. Um, but that doesn't produce the righteousness of God in them. That's not going to produce just repentance in my, my child because I'm yelling at them, because I'm angry with them. It's not going to, my anger is never going to produce the righteousness that I maybe I'm wanting to see in somebody. That's, that's what James is saying. It's, it doesn't accomplish that. It doesn't accomplish anything righteous or good there. Right? Again, anger can point to something that is maybe good and something needs to be done about that situation. So I have a righteous anger and my child is disobeying or that um, our culture is going crazy over abortion and transgender stuff. Um, there can be a sense of some righteous anger there. Um, but maybe I'm sinning in some of that response. But there's still, again, there's some, right, there's some good things that maybe it's pointing to. And so rather than letting my anger take over and letting that negative emotion um, kind of grip me in, in some simple ways, I can use that right thought of what's going on here and, and be a source of good. Uh, David Pallison wrote a book called Good and Angry. Um, he talks about kind of that idea that because anger is a negative emotion, um, and we use energy when we're angry, using our, our energy in a sinful, draining way to be kind of good in our in our anger, to be angry, do not sin, is to see in righteous anger and be a source of good and use the you know energy, if you will, our 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 energy and our emotions, and our skills and things God's given to us, be a source of good to attack the problem, to attack. Maybe the situation that's going on to to address a problem in, in a way that's honoring to the Lord, rather than one is uh, that that is uh, you know seeking to control or, or demand a certain situation, a certain outcome, or something. Right. <clears throat> um, get anger always is going to involve a lack of self control. Proverbs is just it's just all over the place there. Um, you know, like a city broken into without walls, so is a man without self-control. Uh, I think it's Proverbs 17. No. 17, 27, as he holds back his words, has knowledge, the man who has a cold spirit is a man of discernment. It's a man who is not given outbursts of anger, is a, he's discerning. Maybe it's Proverbs 18. No. Maybe Proverbs 28, maybe? <clears throat> this is where I wish I had that. This thing's listed out again, so we have to <laughs> be going everywhere. But I think it's yeah. oh well. Um, yeah, the proverbs, you know, man who is who is angry is basically like a man who is, or, or like a city that has no walls. There's no defense. Uh, Proverbs 29, 11, the fool gives all vent to a spirit, but a man who's or a wise man holds it back. So there's this lot, there's a lack of self-control in, in, in our in our anger. Right. And 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 one way I, I like to ex- give an example to this, even to my kids or to, to myself, is uh somebody can be, you know, maybe somebody can be yelling, screaming, they get a phone call. Oh, hello, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. 
immediately we calm down. Immediately. Immediately we're calm. We're self-controlled. Hang on the phone. Ah, how dare you? Immediately. People can respond differently at church. They're not as explosive. They're not yelling. They're not screaming. They're able to, to show the gentleness. But when they go home, it's still in the story. People can use self-control just when they want to because they're fearing man. Right? Fear of man is a, it's a great indicator of that. Uh, but often we're not fearing God, so that's why we have a lack of self-control there in our outburst of anger. Again, anger always accompanies, is always accompanied by other sins when left un unchecked. Proverbs 29, 22. Uh, an angry man stirs up strife, and a hot temper of man abounds in transgression. He abounds in sin. There's more and more sin. Again, he's going to he's going to turn to other things. Worse things are going to happen. Again, if that's number ten there as well. If not dealt with, anger will turn into something worse. Right? It'll turn into many different things: murder, um, adultery, uh, you know, theft, whatever. You know, broken relationships, unresolved conflicts, many, many other things. Right? You get an examination. Again, qu questions to ask somebody. Ask yourself, is there anyone with whom I'm currently angry? Like, you know, I'm just, I'm just constantly angry about this. Why am I angry or what am I angry with them about? How have I dealt with or responded to that, to that person? Um, what do I typically do when I'm responding in anger? Again, what does it look like? Uh, and um, I often will ask that, well, how do you respond in anger? What does that, how does it manifest? Well, I, I yell and my spouse um, is kind of quiet. You know, and her anger just stews, or he stews on it, and while I yell at him, right? <clears throat> I, or, or I throw things, or I, I uh, post it on social media, or I, you know, whatever. I, I, I go on a run when I'm angry. Okay, well, that's better than yelling. But uh, the Bible doesn't say when you're angry you run. It doesn't say that. Go on a run. Great. Re relieve some, some some tension fine <clears throat> maybe in your running pray ask the lord to forgive you to repent of your sin and think about how you can serve the other person or whatever but that's not the only response we should have when we're angry right um how might god be trying to reveal my anger problem to me like how is god doing that uh, maybe what have been the results of my anger oh i punched a hole in the wall and broke my hand or i i lost relationships or i don't have a good relationship with my dad and my mom and my, my my sibling or my coworker or people in the church because I'm just angry. <clears throat> um, do other people see me as critical or, or impatient? Well, how do I know? Ask them. Hey, do you see me as being critical or being impatient with people? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Yes or no, right? Um, <clears throat> it, you know, last couple of times you got angry. What were you doing? Who were you with? What were you thinking? And yeah, maybe there's a pattern. I'm only get angry with these people. When I don't get my way or whatever. What kind of things provoke you to anger? You know, so on. There's lots of other questions we could ask there. Um, and that's like if you're trying to help somebody deal with their anger, or just maybe there's maybe there's a pattern. They're only responding to anger at home or among certain people, or when they are told no, or whatever. And kids are told no, so they respond in anger that way. Oh, my kid's great and happy until he's told no. Then he turns into a monster. Of course he does. He's a kid. Spank that reprobate, right? <clears throat> he needs to be told no many times in his life. Uh, my wife, when she was in college, uh, was a nanny. And nanny for some family, she said, you know, we, 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 we limit the number of no's we say to our child. So don't tell him no ever. We'll do that. But we limit the number of times you say no. <laughs> That didn't last. She wouldn't last for very long. She's like, I can't. I can't handle this. This kid's insane, uh, <clears throat> right? Um, and I mean, you see that in our culture. You just see the anger and the frustration, and you know, especially during during uh, 2020, the riots and stuff. And then the media says this is great. They're venting their anger because of the the decades and the millennia or the centuries of of abuse that people have had, and and of you know, injustices and stuff. Like, no, the Bible says that you're foolish. You're a fool. You're letting out, you're, you're venting your spirit. You're, 2011, you're a fool. It's not okay. That's sin. There's no righteousness in venting anger and showing your anger. There's no righteousness in that. It's sin. 
It's, it's folly. All right, <clears throat> off my soapbox. Um, <clears throat> again, transformation, how do we change? When we're dealing with anger, I need to be thinking not just, okay, how do I respond in anger in the moment, but before I get angry again, before I'm tempted to respond in anger again, what should I do? Well, I need to confess my sin. I need to pray. I need to be re renewing my mind and re I need to be renewing the thoughts of my heart so that I'm <clears throat> not just going to be given the anger again and again and again and again and again and never dealing with it, but I'm thinking rightly. I'm putting off sin. I'm putting on righteous thinking. I'm memorizing certain verses. I'm I'm, I'm actively thinking of ways to respond rightly or to think rightly or to, or to respond in ways that are patient. Right? <clears throat> um, trying to put on godly thoughts and godly actions. Um, I need to do a study on the patience of God because the word patient in, uh, in, um, in uh, Galatians 5 and through the Spirit um, Love is patient in me, or sorry, not First Corinthians 13, excuse me. <laughs> Love is patient means a long way from wrath, long suffering, a long way from wrath. That's what that word means. So I need to do a study in God's patience or God's long suffering. What does that mean? Well, how does, what does that mean for me? What does it mean that God's gracious? How do I need to grow in being gracious with people? So rather than being angry, how can I show them grace? In trying to think, this is, and this is repentance. I'm putting off those old ways of thinking and putting on how do I need to be gracious and patient instead of angry and putting those things into practice so that patience and grace become more habitual as opposed to my anger. Ask other people to hold me accountable, trying to you know, use self-control in, in my thoughts and so on. And also what, one way to help with this is not associating yourself with other angry people. Proverbs 22, 24 says, don't associate with one given to anger. If you're an angry, I had to tell us to a counseling case, a counseling guy one time, like, hey, you're, um, the reason you don't have a lot of friends is probably because people don't want to be around you because you're just angry. Um, like, do you see that? Like, no, well, you, you need to see that because you're angry um, and you're telling me all the ways in which it's manifested and all the relationships you've lost because this is true. People don't want to associate with somebody who's, who's angry all the time. Um, you warn people of that, right? So again, but part of the repentance process is working through this. Maybe in the midst of my anger, what do I, what, what do I need to do? How should I prepare for that? Again, in the midst of my anger, when I'm tempted to respond in anger, and maybe in the moment, I'm just oh, I'm so frustrated, I need to pray. Help me not to respond in anger and help me not to yell or to vent or to be whatever. I'm going to use self-control. I need to repent of that anger as quickly as I can. Ask myself, what right now am I wanting so badly that I'm willing to sin to get it? What's in my way? What's the goal that I'm after that is being a hinder such that I'm willing to yell or to scream or to demand or to put someone down in order to get that thing? Ask myself that. Instead of those things, I need to be thinking, man, what? How do I need to respond right now in grace and patience? How do I need to, to, to shut my mouth and respond in self-control? How do I need to think about maybe what's God, uh, God's goal rather than mine? What's his kingdom rather than mine? Um, how can I serve people rather than wanting to be served? These sort of thoughts, depending on the person, right? There's, there's some examples here of what needs to be done instead. And well, how am I supposed to do that in the midst of your anger? I, I pray. I, this is just what we're called to do. Um, it'll take time. It takes it takes effort to think this way, to put off sinful anger, to put on righteousness and holiness and faithfulness. Right. Again, after you respond in anger and in sinful ways, again, again, be specific. How did I sin in this way? What was I worshiping? What was I wanting? What should I do differently? Um, how, who do I need? Who do I need to seek forgiveness from? Who do I need to to make restitution to if I respond in certain ways? Again, how do I need to maybe adjust my plan or just other verses to be thinking on just to make sure I'm meditating and not giving up? The temptation isn't my sin again in anger or sin in any way. Like, I gave up again. What's, I, why, I, why keep trying? I keep sinning. What's the point? We need to keep mortifying our sin and keep trying and keep pursuing and keep pressing, in, pressing on 
um, knowing that we're going to keep sinning in certain ways, but we will continually grow and have victory. Um, we will be able to, to deal with this and to fight this according to God's grace and his spirit and his word. But we can't be passive about it, nor can we give up because it's hard. Nor can we give up because we've failed once or twice. We can't do that. Even with somebody, <clears throat> um, you know, kind of a good example of this is somebody who's maybe given over to addictions or I like you know, enslaving sins. Oh, I gave him the drunkenness again, or I, I you know, I, I smoked dope again. Okay, well, I mean, you're just going to give up and just because you sinned again, you're just going to give up and just give back into that lifestyle. Like, no, you sinned. Yeah, it's wicked, and, and you need to repent. Uh, but what other choice do you have? You have a choice either to, to repent, to trust the Lord, to keep pursuing him and to, to grow in his grace and to get help to no longer sin that way. Or you can choose to, to turn away from the Lord and give full, get full into that, that sin. So what, I mean, what are you, what are you going to do? Same with anger. You're going to keep sinning in this way. You, you keep growing in the Lord and you keep pursuing him, keep seeking his forgiveness, keep growing, keep repenting. And, and the more you do that, you'll see how the more and more you're responding in, in patience and in grace and in kindness and in love and compassion. But if you just don't and you give up and say, well, I might as well just give up. This is just too hard. I keep sinning. Then you just, you're going to give full vent to your anger. You give full vent to your sin and you're going to go down a path that you don't like. And, it, and it's going to be bad. Uh, and that's how it is with any sin. Um, but anger is one of those sins in our culture. It can all, almost be seen as uh, acceptable. Even in the church, me seen it as acceptable at times. Right. Um, we did some other homework there. I say see homework attachments, which I didn't attach. Um, maybe they're in the end of your notes. I don't know. They're not end of your notes. Um, Uh, nope, it's not there. Um, I I don't. What happened there? I thought I had a list of uh, attached homework assignments on like anger and stuff, but uh, I'll have to look at my files and see if I have. I have a bunch of stuff, but I'll, I'll um, I can email you. Um, what I'll do after this call, I'll, I'll email you um, kind of some of the homework assignments, normal ones that I kind of give out to people that are kind of self-explanatory um, on anger. Uh, that would be helpful. Uh, this for you to have in your files and stuff, but I'll, I'll do it after, right after this call, just so I don't forget. Um, we'll stop there though, and then we'll get into sexual sin next time. Um, get a helpful thing, and this would be um, geared for both men and women. Um, uh, we talked about sins before in the marriage and family counseling class, but this will be a little more specific. Um, and uh, then we'll talk about depression, I believe, as well. So any thoughts, so any um, questions at this point? Cool. All right, guys, I'm going to pray. Um, and uh, let you go. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word by which we can read and understand who you are and what you have called us to and disciple making and counseling and also how you called us into sanctification and to grow in areas of anxiety and fear to trust in you to not give vent to our our anger but to even trust in you in that to trust in your situations and to cling to you and um, or to uh, to repent of one of our sins we thank you that your word is clear on these issues give us grace to respond rightly in these ways give us opportunities and grace to even minister this to others even this week, Father. We just ask all this in your great and powerful name. Amen. All right, thank you guys very much. Uh, Lord willing, we'll see you um, next week. Awesome. Thank you.